How you doing? I'm Callan and this is Slapped Ham. Today we're once again looking at some unsolved cases. From the mysterious Moon Eye people of Georgia to the disappearance of an entire village in Canada. We take a look at five historical mysteries that have left experts stumped. But before we get into it, remember to hit that subscribe button for more awesome creepy content just like this. In early December 1873, a very strange event took place in Bristol, England. On December 8th, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas B. Cumston travelled to Bristol for a brief vacation. They checked into a quaint hotel thinking they'd have a restful holiday. But what took place was a bizarre occurrence that frightened and confused them so much that they were arrested for disorderly conduct. Early that evening, the Cumstons heard unusual noises emanating from the vicinity of their room. They promptly reported the disturbance to the proprietor who, while having heard the noises, didn't really think too much about it. Eventually, the Cumstons retired for the night, but they woke at around 3am when they once again heard the strange noises. As they leapt from the bed, the Cumstons discovered that not only had the disturbing sounds returned, but it also seemed as if the floor was eroding beneath them. Mrs. Cumston immediately cried out for help, but their voices had taken on a strange hollow quality that gave the impression that their shouts were being echoed by disembodied entities. As the floor opened up, Mr. Cumston found himself being pulled towards the chasm, only escaping when his wife pulled him to safety. The frightened couple exited through a window and ran away into the night, thinking that criminals had broken into their room intending to kidnap them. They made their way to a railway station where they caused such a stir that they were arrested for disorderly conduct. When they appeared in court, the proprietor of the hotel testified that while she had heard some unusual noises, she had not perceived them as any sort of threat. During the investigation, the police examined the couple's room but didn't find anything out of order. The court eventually decided that the Cumstons had suffered from a shared hallucination and they were allowed to go. No explanation has ever been given about what actually happened to the Cumstons. One theory involves the possibility of a portal opening up to a parallel universe. The mystery remains unsolved. Located in Chatsworth, Georgia, Fort Mountain is part of the Kohata Mountains in the Appalachians. The mystery of Fort Mountain is the ancient rock wall located on the mountain. It's an impressive structure measuring 885 feet long with 29 pits, stone rings, cans and the ruins of a gateway scattered along its path. In some areas the wall is 7 feet tall and 12 feet thick, but the average height is 2 to 3 feet tall. But who built this mysterious wall? It was first thought that the wall was built as a fort by Hernando de Soto at around 1540 as a defense against the Creek Native Americans. But this theory was abandoned when it was pointed out that de Soto was only in the area for approximately two weeks. The most interesting and lasting theory actually comes from Cherokee natives. The Cherokees stated that the wall was built by a tribe of moon-eyed people. These individuals were called moon-eyed because they had pale grey eyes. They were also described as being smaller in stature than other native tribes and they also had pale skin. Cherokee legends state that the tribe lived in the area before the Cherokee arrived in the late 1700s and drove them out. The Cherokee went on to say that not only did the Munai people build the wall, they also built a temple inside the fort that included a large stone snake with ruby stone eyes. So who were the Munai people? A popular theory suggests that they were actually of Welsh descent. It's thought that the Welsh prince Madoc Ob Owain Gwynedd left his homeland after his father passed away, due to upheaval among the surviving sons fighting over their father's land. Madoc set sail in 1170, and it's thought that he landed in the vicinity of Mobile Bay, Alabama. Madoc eventually returned home and gathered resources as well as followers before returning to the Alabama region on 10 ships. It was the last time he would ever be heard from in Wales. Some historians think that Madoc and his colonists built the fortifications on Fort Mountain, along with a similar fortification near DeSoto Falls, Alabama, which is said to be identical to the layout of Dolwidian Castle, Madoc's birthplace. All of this has led to the conclusion that the moon -eyed people were actually the descendants of Madoc and his people. Historians, geologists and archaeologists still wonder about the origin of the fortifications on Fort Mountain. Many feel that the structures had some sort of ceremonial significance, while others think that the wall and other structures were intended for defence. 
Ultimately, the answers lay buried in the past, but it's interesting to note that many strange occurrences have occurred on Fort Mountain, including the sounds of phantom drum beats and the sighting of shadow figures that seem to be patrolling the ancient wall. In November 1930, fur trapper Joe LaBelle headed for an Inuit village located on the shores of Lake Anjakuni in Canada, hoping for a warm and safe place to get out of the cold for the night. LaBelle was quite familiar with the little village, but what he found there that evening was rather disturbing. The village was normally a bustling hive of activity, but when LaBelle called out a greeting, the only response he heard was the echoes of his own voice dancing across the lake. LaBelle immediately sensed that something was terribly wrong. There was no smoke coming from the chimneys, no voices to be heard in the distance, not even the barking of the sled dogs that resided in the village. LaBelle checked all of the shacks in the village, expecting to find the villagers had packed their belongings and left. Instead, he found that food, weapons and personal belongings had all been abandoned. In some cases, LaBelle even found meals prepared but left uneaten, as well as half-finished chores that seemed as if they had been suddenly discarded. There was no sign of a struggle anywhere. Even though he was cold and tired, LaBelle exited the village and headed to a telegraph office located several miles away. He later admitted that the empty village frightened him and that he was concerned that he too would disappear as the villagers had. LaBelle sent an emergency message to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who immediately made their way to the village. Along the way, they stopped to chat with a local trapper, who informed them that he had recently seen an unusual gleaming object in the sky that seemed to be headed right for the Anjakuni village. Once they arrived at the village, the Mounties not only confirmed LaBelle's account, they made even more bizarre discoveries. Every tomb in the village burial ground had been opened and emptied, with the marker stones stacked in two orderly piles. Things continued to get more disturbing. The Mounties discovered the bodies of the village sled dogs dead of starvation. After an investigation, the Mounties came to the conclusion that the villagers had disappeared approximately eight weeks before LaBelle's arrival, based on berries found in a cook pot. Other than an approximate time of the disappearance, the Mounties weren't able to determine anything else, including where the villagers went. So what happened to the missing villagers? Several theories have been tossed around, including alien abduction, angry ghosts, curses, and even vampires. The Mounties have since discredited the story as a legend, but there are simply too many accounts about the events to simply dismiss it. On December 9th, 1531, 57-year-old Juan Diego was on his way to church in Tenochtitlan, Mexico, when he suddenly heard music near Tepeyac Hill. At first, he thought it was a bird song, but before long, Diego wondered if he was actually hearing a heavenly chorus. Soon, the music faded away, and instead, Diego began to hear the voice of a woman calling his name from the top of Tepeyac Hill. Diego made his way to the top where he encountered a girl who in appearance seemed to be around 15 years old. She seemed to be giving off a glowing light that lit up the area and she was dressed in an attractive red and gold gown and a star-studded turquoise cloak. While Diego stood gaping at the apparition, the girl told him that she was the Virgin Mary, mother of the true God who gives life. Mary went on to tell Juan Diego to build a church on the hill so that others could come and receive comfort and guidance. She then told Diego to pay a visit to Don Fray Juan de Zumaraga, the Bishop of Mexico, and tell him that the Virgin Mary wanted a church built. Juan Diego made his way to the bishop and, in time, was granted an audience. He relayed Mary's desire to have a church built to the bishop, but the bishop promptly shot him down, stating that he wasn't willing to consider such a project based on a whimsical vision. Diego headed home, feeling that he had failed. Along the way, he once again encountered Mary, and he told her of his encounter with the bishop. Once again, Mary instructed him to approach the bishop. Diego did as he was bid, but this time the bishop was more willing to hear Diego out. He told Diego to ask Mary for a miraculous sign to prove her identity. The bishop then sent two servants to follow Diego home and deliver a full report to him of what took place. The servants attempted to follow Diego, but they lost sight of him and had to report back to the bishop that they had failed at their task. While the servants were reporting their failure, Diego was once again approached by the vision of Mary. He explained that the bishop required a miraculous sign. Mary instructed Diego to return at dawn the next day to receive the sign. 
Unfortunately, Diego's uncle fell ill and he was unable to return to Mary at the appointed time. When he made his way back to Tepeyac Hill, not only did Mary forgive him, but she also healed his uncle. She then instructed Diego to go to the top of the hill and gather the flowers that grew there. Diego climbed the hill even though it was winter and there was a frost on the ground. He didn't expect to find any flowers, but surprisingly he found that roses were growing on the hill. He gathered the flowers into his tilma or poncho and took them back to the Virgin. Mary arranged the flowers into a pattern onto Diego's poncho and then helped him to put it on his back, tying the corners around his neck to hold the roses. She then sent Diego back to the bishop, telling him not to show the roses to anyone along the way. The bishop was shocked when Diego presented the roses. He had secretly prayed for a sign of roses and here they were, but even more stunning was the tilma itself. Where the roses had rested, there was now a beautiful image of the Virgin Mary imprinted on the poncho. The symbolism in the image was very specific, easily conveying a message of love to the natives of Mexico. The image was displayed in the local cathedral until Mary's church could be built. Over a period of seven years from the first time the image was displayed, it was estimated that approximately 8 million pagan Mexicans converted to Christianity. The image is still on display today at the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico. So is the image a true miracle? Millions of people seem to think so. The cloak, which is made of cactus fibers, has shown no sign of disintegration, and it's been noted that the image of a bearded man can be seen in the right eye of the image of Mary, leading the devout to believe that it's a reflection of what she saw in 1531, Juan Diego on Tepeyac Hill. Before we get to that number one spot and take a look at a case of a young boy who disappeared into thin air, remember to hit that subscribe button and turn on channel notifications. That way you'll be completely up to date with all our latest content. On November 8th, 1878, a strange occurrence took place on the Ashmore farm near Quincy, Illinois. 16-year-old Charles Ashmore grabbed a bucket and headed outside to fetch water from the nearby spring. The spring was only a short distance away, so when he didn't promptly return, his father Christian and sister Martha went out to search for Charles, fearing that he might have slipped and fallen in the snow. Once outside, Christian and Martha saw Charles's footprints in the newly fallen snow, leading from the house and across the backyard. His footprints only travelled approximately 75 yards, and then the tracks suddenly ended, with nothing but pristine snow beyond. It was as if Charles had been plucked up mid-step. Christian and Martha continued on to the spring, taking care not to disturb the tracks as they did so. When they reached the spring, they saw that the water had a film of ice, indicating that Charles had never even made it there. Four days later, Mrs. Ashmore went to the spring, where she said that she heard the voice of her son calling out to her when she crossed the area where his footprints had ended. This continued to occur for several months after the disappearance. The voice of Charles seemed to grow fainter as time passed, and though all of the family heard the voice, they couldn't make out what was being said. By the summer of 1879, the voice was no longer heard at all. There has been a lot of controversy surrounding this story. Some believe that it's a purely fictional story written by Ambrose Bierce. Others believe that Bierce based his story on a true account. It was known that Bierce was very intrigued by all things Fortean. He investigated an 1854 case of a man named Orion Williamson, who was said to have disappeared while walking across his property while at least two other people were watching. He was never found even though a large search party was incorporated. Just like Charles Ashmore, Williamson was periodically heard calling out for several months after his disappearance. It was theorized that Williamson had walked into a void spot of universal ether. Whatever the case may be, these two disappearances remain unsolved. Well, there's another episode down. Thank you so much for watching. If you're enjoying our content, then why not click that embedded link there or there's some playlist links in the description box below for you to binge on. Slap that thumbs up button as well. And that's it for me. I'll see you all next time.